Nearly 15,000 students graduate with gender and cultural studies degrees each year. 15,000 innocent young people conned out of their money and left for brain dead. It's a national disgrace. What happens to a young person who has suffered this fate? It's more than likely he or she or they or it or whatever the poor slob has been taught to call himself goes on to commit the same terrible crime against others that has been committed against him or it or whatevs by writing gender study or cultural study articles in peer-reviewed journals. Our crack team of hard-working researchers managed to unearth some of these articles by taking time out during the cutscenes of Ratchet and Clank to read a piece by Elizabeth Harrington of Freebeacon.com. All articles and quotes are non-made up. A peer-reviewed article published last year in Progress in Human Geology was entitled Glaciers, Gender, and Science a feminist glaciology framework for global environmental change research. The article says that while glaciers are, quote, key icons of climate change, the relationships among gender, science, and glaciers remain understudied. This paper proposes a feminist glaciology leading to more just and equitable human ice interactions, unquote. To be fair, this article did improve my personal relationship with ice by causing me to pour a large dollop of whiskey over it. Another article from Dance Research Journal is called The Pilates Pelvis, Racial Implications of the Immobile Hips. This article, quote, examines the treatment of the pelvis in the Pilates exercises, single leg stretch and leg circles, which reinforce behaviors of a racially white aesthetic, unquote. In order to personally check this assertion, I watched dozens of videos of scantily clad women stretching their sleek, well-toned legs open and closed and up. What was I talking about? Oh, yes. Another example of the tragic detritus left behind by the minds of gender and cultural studies students comes from a publication called Men and Masculinities, which features articles by people who seem never to have experienced either. One article puts forward the theory that the condition known as impotence or erectile dysfunction is a fiction meant to reinforce, quote, dominant phallocratic notions of healthy male heterosexuality, unquote. The author asserts that by using feminist analysis, she will eliminate the perceived need for an erection. I can personally testify that that works like a charm. And finally, from the journal SSRN comes the article, The Lactating Man, which says, quote, lactation and breastfeeding are typically viewed as inherently female activities. This article questions this gender normativity of milk and argues that male lactation blurs the distinction between male and female, as well as perhaps between humans and animals, unquote. Police are still hunting for the author of this article to make sure she doesn't go anywhere near children or men or cows. I think these sad documents prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that gender and cultural studies are among the leading causes of ignorance, stupidity, and madness. I would call for their complete abolition, but I need the laughs. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Claven, and this is The Andrew Claven Show. I feel hunky-dunky, life is tickety-boo. Birds are winging, also singing, hunky dunky doo Ship-shaped, ipsy-topsy, the world is a bitty zing It's a wonderful day, hurrah, hooray, it makes me want to sing Oh, hurrah, hooray, oh, hooray, hurrah we are back the last day before the Clavenless weekend. It's been kind of a Clavenless week, to be honest. And even though I was here, I couldn't get... You should see... You, if you could see the place that we are broadcasting... I, I feel like I'm broadcasting out of the ruins of Berlin at this point. I should be talking in German. We did get our sign back. This is good. I mean, this, this is the most expensive part. And we do have our two lights that are stolen from the no-tell motel rooms rented by the hour. <laughs> 
it's the, the lobby. Somebody, some hooker in the lobby is going, where are the lights? You know? <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> so we, we, today we, we are going to talk about the New York Times because you remember the old story about the psychiatrist who tries to cure the optimist kid by bringing him into a room that's just full of horse manure and the kid is so thrilled and he starts digging through the horse manure and he says, with all this manure, there's got to be a pony here someplace. Yeah. The New York Times has now perfected being pure manure, no pony. <laughs> so we're going to get to that in a little while. But first, we have to talk about Quip. And the reason Quip comes up is because, you know, we've been missing Michael Knowles while we've been around today. And I saw on Twitter that Knowles tweeted out his breakfast today, which was a cup of coffee and a cigar. So if you have a cup of coffee and a cigar for breakfast, your teeth are going to look <laughs> terrible. They're going to look just absolutely black and disgusting. And if you want to know how to keep your teeth white and clean, you got to use an electric toothbrush. They really work. I, I use them all the time. They really work well. They really do keep all the stains off your teeth. But but the typical electric toothbrush is, is like the size of a cannon. It's like carrying a cannon around. When you travel, you have to leave it behind. And that is why there is Quip, which Quip is a beautifully designed, sleek electric toothbrush. Works on a AAA battery, I think it is. And it just has a super slim design. You can pack it. If you're traveling, you can throw it in your dop kit. It works great. And it solves the other problem which electric toothbrushes have, which is that you can subscribe and for just five bucks every three months, they'll send you a new brush because you're supposed to replace these things every three months and it's really easy to forget. And you know, who knows when you bought the thing? You know, are you gonna mark it on your calendar? No, this just shows up at your door with a new brush. You which you will need. Uh, Quip is backed by leading dentists and was named as one of Time Magazine's best inventions of 2016. They won a 2016 GQ Grooming Award and lots of other things. And you can see, you just have to look at it. You'll see Quip starts at just 25 bucks. And right now, to get Quip, if you go to quip.com slash Claven, you'll get your first refill pack free with a Quip electric toothbrush. That's quip.com slash Claven, K-L-A-V-A-N. Your first refill pack free at quip.com slash Claven, G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash Claven. They're really good. They're, they're just good looking and uh, that, the electric toothbrush is terrific for your teeth. Before we talk about, obviously, we're still dealing with the aftermath of this uh, terrible shooting. It's just how, how you know, when, when these things, when you avoid the big disaster, I mean, Steve Scalise is still in critical condition, so it could degenerate into a disaster. But when you think about what it could have been, I mean, the nightmare that it could have been, you know, you it means that you've avoided this disaster, which is the main thing. But there's the subheading of the fact that now you don't really realize the full effect of what happened and the full reality of what happened. And the reason for that, we have to say, has to do with two people uh, named Crystal Griner and David Bailey, who were the cops, uh, the police, the Capitol Police, who were assigned to Scalise because he was in the leadership and wouldn't have been there had they not been somebody in leadership uh, uh, present. And they just opened fired on the shooter were wounded, continued firing, and were uh, and took the guy out, and also ran to help the victims at the same time. Amazing heroes, and I think that here is a stupid, obvious point that no, I haven't heard anyone make because it's kind of politically incorrect. So if you can't come here to hear stupid, obvious, politically incorrect points, where are you going to go? I just want to point out that these two cops, very high probability that they're Democrats. Okay, and the reason I say that is only 4% of the people in Washington, D.C. voted for Donald Trump. These are two people of some color, you know, there's some shade of brown, the two of them. Uh, Crystal Griner is married, is a woman married to a woman. So these are people in the kind of typical constituency of the Democrat Party. And if it's fair to point out the, the fact that the shooter was a leftist and was acting on leftist principles for leftist reasons. He was a Bernie bro. He was, you know, he was killing people. And if it's, if it's also fair to point out, as I have repeatedly pointed out, that the people that the black lives, the white cops, that the Black Lives Matter and the New York Times are always pillaring are risking their lives to defend the Black Lives Matter constituency, I think it's fair to point out that underneath all the screaming and yelling we're doing at each other, um, are people on both sides of high nobility and grace who we should uh, be talking about uh, you know, from time to time. We should remember that even though it is, it is right and good and fitting for us to fight at the top of our lungs and fight fervently and even viciously at times for the things that we believe in, you know, I always say this, I'm a conservative because I'm a liberal. I'm a conservative because I want everyone to be free, everyone to do what he wants. I don't want the cops breaking in 
on a, uh, in the, into a gay person's bedroom any more than I want the cops breaking in on my bedroom. And I was alive at the time when that could happen. So I don't want that happening. I don't want a florist who, for religious reasons, uh, won't go to a gay wedding, won't uh, service a gay wedding. I don't want her him or her penalized any more than I want myself to be penalized. I mean, my freedom is, depends on everybody else's freedom. And that is a conservative principle now that only one side believes in that. Only one side believes in free speech. And so I am a conservative for some of the people, in, on behalf of some of the people who hate me and some of the people who demonize me, you know. And that, this, this brings me to a story I want to talk about. While By way, I will get back to the shooting and the aftermath of the shooting. But I want to talk about a, a stupid story about Stephen Miller from Heat Street. And it's not that Stephen is, is stupid, but there, he, when Wonder Woman came out, a theater in New York, the Alamo Theater, announced they were going to have a woman-only screening. And Stephen Miller decided to troll them by buying a ticket to the woman-only screening and posting it on Twitter. And his point was, first of all, just to annoy them, obviously, but, but his real point was that in New York State, it's illegal to keep people out of a public place on gender grounds, on grounds of gender, race, or anything like that. And so he was saying, you know, that while this, they're being triumphantly feminist, they are also bar breaking the law. And nobody had pointed this out. And of course, Twitter went nuts and they were yelling at him, why do you have to do this? And, you know, rolling their eyes at him. And, oh, men, this is typical men and all this stuff. And he got all, all these things and he was hammered and hammered, just complete, you know, complete Twitter madness. The usual thing that happens on Twitter when you disagree with somebody, just slinging insults, curse words, the whole thing. So he goes to the movie, right? And he walks in and he gives his ticket and they're sitting there in the movie, you know, the guy, well, one guy, I guess, in this, in this theater, and he writes this. He says, I didn't know what to expect showing up to an advertised all women's screening of Wonder Woman where radical outrage mongers on Twitter were offering bounties to either mace me in the face or dump soda on my head. Okay, that's what they were saying. When I took my seat, there were no hisses, no soda bombs, no photographs, no daily show ambushes or mobs of proud boys, whatever the hell they are, no managers asking me to leave. By the, the reaction upon arrival, it became apparent how Twitter outrage is not real life. And as I had predicted, no one in the theater would care. This was a movie theater, not a college campus, and everyone there was there for the same reason. It's the most anticlimactic case of a man buying a movie ticket in recent history. But that one line, I think, is really important to remember, that Twitter outrage is not real life. And when you have a shooting like we had uh, yesterday where Republicans were targeted and people go on Twitter and some of them were people who should know better, who worked for venues like Huffington Post, and they should be fired. And of course, that guy, Milos, what's his name? The guy who does um, um, the Daily Coast was one of them just saying horrible, violent, ugly things about the victims. But most of the people saying those things, they don't represent anybody. They have no constituency, you know, or if they have a constituency, it's one another. Most of us understand that this is not the way to go forward. And I think the problem is, the problem, the problem is that the media business model is built to service the outrage. It is built to service the people who are angriest. And, and this is, you know, it's more on the left because they have more media than, they, than we do. They have more media that is supposed to be, and these are the real offenders. They have more media that is supposed to be objective and straightforward and fair and balanced and isn't. They have ABC, they have CBS, they have NBC, they have CNN, all of them supposed to be direct news, New York Times, all the news that's fit to print. And, and they are all lying, and they are the ones who are following this business model. It's different when we at the Daily Wire, a right-wing site, or the folks at MSNBC, a left-wing place, when they service their constituency, that's different than what you are seeing at, for instance, the New York Times. The business model is to serve the people you know will come back because a lot of people who aren't angry, a lot of people who aren't consistently outraged, aren't thinking about politics all the time. You know, Americans traditionally don't think about politics all the time because that's one of the good things about freedom. You don't have to think about politics all the time. So if you want to serve your audience, you have to, you have to say outrageous, biased things on the left or right. And that, to serve that business model, has become... You know, it used, it used to be things like CBS, NBC, and ABC. They were liberal, but they weren't what they are now, which is simply manufactured hatred, left-wing hatred that comes, comes out. And it's very divisive because we all feel we're being lied to. Which brings me 
to the New York Times. But before I talk to the New York Times, I've got to say goodbye to Facebook and YouTube. That means you got to come over to thedailywire.com to hear the rest of the show and to subscribe. And if you subscribe for the year, you get Ben's new book about the championship White Sox. That's it's a you have to do. That's an annual subscription. It's a lousy eight bucks a month. And for that lousy eight bucks a month, you can be in the mailbag, which, as you saw yesterday, results in all your problems being solved. So come on over to thedailywire.com.